This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 414, recorded on November 2nd, 2016. This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,500 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first two months are completely free. If you sign up at curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. I have a very, very special episode for you today. I have a guest right here in studio at Columbia University. You have heard him before on TWIV uh, as a part of a panel that we did, uh, I think, back in May at the American Society for Microbiology. Now I have him all to myself. He's from Washington University in St. Louis. Michael Diamond, welcome back. Thank you, Vincent. Glad to be here. You were uh, at that ASM TWIV, if you remember, with a bunch of other people. I do remember it. But today, the focus is on you entirely. <laughs> We're going to hear all about you and uh, your work. A lot of exciting things happening. Before we get into that, I want to tell everyone about a message from the Department of Mi Microbiology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. They want you to know about their graduate and postdoctoral programs, composed of over 20 virology labs, all centralized in one building in the heart of New York City. The department is a perfect fit for anyone with an interest in pursuing virus research. The department is presently looking to recruit any prospective graduate students to apply to their program by December 1. Okay, there's a December 1 deadline, so don't miss it. Interested postdocs also encouraged to contact faculty of interest. For more information about the department, visit bit.ly slash micro MSSM. Okay, that's all one word bit.ly slash M-I-C-R-O-M-S-S-M for more information. Full disclosure, I did my PhD at Mount Sinai. Did you know that? Did not know that. It was Peter Palacy's first PhD. Oh, student. actually, I seem to remember that. <laughs> I had heard you worked with Peter. That makes sense now. How's it, how does it make sense? <laughs> I'm um, just curious. <laughs> you're still a big proponent of the virology program at Mount Sinai. You bet. A lot of good people there. We had one of them visiting today for your seminar, Matt, Matt Evans. I want to talk about Zika and Chick. Great. How's that? Perfect. But first, you were born right here in New York City, right? I was born in New York tell, City. Tell us your upbringing and, and up until where you are now, uh, just uh, your training and so forth. So I was born in Queens, in the, one of the outer boroughs here, out just beyond Shea Stadium. And I went to public school in Queens, and then I went to high school in the Bronx, at Bronx High School of Science. Ooh, good school. And then I went to right. Columbia University. I did my undergraduate at the same institution. <laughs> Another good school. <laughs> I had my first research experience at, uh, at a building that is just across the street from us. Mm -hmm. As I told Vincent, I haven't been back here in more than 30 years. And after um, undergraduate, I did my uh, MD-PhD at Harvard Medical School and Harvard University, where I did a PhD in immunology and worked on adhesion molecules in the immune system with Timothy Springer. Then I went to Berkeley and did a postdoc in Drosophila genetics with Jerry Rubin. Subsequently did my internship residency and clinical fellowship in infectious diseases at UCSF. Went and did a postdoc, second postdoc with Eva Harris in virology, worked on dengue there, and then started my lab in 2001 at Washington University in St. Louis, primarily uh, working on West Nile virus initially, uh, with some continuing projects on dengue. And then we, over the years, have spread into working on many different viruses uh, with part of the lab working on more classical molecular virology, and but most of the lab really working on immune system restriction and immune system evasion of viruses in general mm -hmm. with a lot of work on innate immunity and also on adaptive B-cell immunity. So the fact that you went to Bronx High School of Science meant that early on you were interested in science. Is that how that works? Not so sure exactly how much of that was choice and yeah. how much of that was uh, my parents went there, my brother went there, so I think <laughs> I went there. <laughs> okay, so there's no relation between 
wanting. No, although I did get an outstanding um, scientific uh, secondary school education, no doubt. Mm -hmm. So that was, I think, was very important. I certainly was not dissuaded from studying science. It was very interesting, but I'm not so sure before that time I knew what I was going to do. So for those who don't know, Bronx High School, you you just can't go there. You have to apply and get accepted, right? There, there's an entrance examination, at least there was when I applied, um, and it's it's quite competitive. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a few schools in New York City that have these entrance exams. Uh, Bronx Science and Stuyvesant is another one that's well known. And then you have to get accepted, and then obviously they have uh, ex- uh, excellent um, coursework with expertise and uh, uh, special programs in math and science mm-hmm. as well as in the mm-hmm. arts. So otherwise you go to your local high school. Correct. Right, right. Probably didn't want to do that out near Shea Stadium. Not, not, so, not, not so great. <laughs> they were okay, but they yeah. weren't as good. So did you want to be a doctor at that point? A lot of kids I, know that. Yeah, I, I think that was one of the things I was thinking about. Mm-hmm. I, I was not uh, fully convinced of it, but I think it was certainly one of the things that was possible. And at what point did, you, did that morph into an MD-PhD career? So it morphed in, so after my, uh, I believe it was my junior year, I had a friend who... Um, was working up here at Columbia Presbyterian one summer, and he had a lab that he was interested in working in. And if I recall it correctly, it was a long time ago, um, he had arranged to work with this principal investigator, and then he couldn't do it for some reason. There was some family issue, and I didn't have a uh, job that I was wedded to for that summer. And he said, well, Mike, why don't you go and work in a lab? And I said, "Uh, what's that? essentially, because I had had no research experience. So go on, you go try it out. I think you might like it. And so because of that, I went to that lab and I stayed there for a year or two while I was an undergrad. And then I took a year off between college and um, uh, graduate school or medical school and uh, worked in the lab the whole time. And at that point, I applied for an uh, MD-PhD program. Hmm. Yeah, sometimes uh, there is a defining lab experience that makes the difference. But you're board certified. You can pr- you can practice medicine if you'd like, right? Not so much. No? So I, I was board certified, um, and then I stopped seeing patients about mm-hmm. eight eight or nine years ago, and I no longer have privileges at the hospital, which means I'm no longer insured. Mm-hmm. I let my boards lapse, and the only thing I have is a license, um, which mm-hmm. doesn't really get you much, except to say that you have an MD after your name, yeah, and you yeah. pay some fees, but. Um, for me, uh, being in the lab was something that I loved to do, and also being in the hospital uh, uh, and seeing patients that weren't directly related to my research interests was an issue, as well as the fact this is that for uh, clinician scientists like me, I was seeing patients one month a year, and I didn't feel as clinically competent as perhaps my colleagues who were seeing patients six mm-hmm. months a year mm-hmm. or more. And and so the, all of that weighed down on me to make the decision that, I would rather be in the lab if I could. And because my lab at that time was expanding and becoming successful, I had a very understanding a chairman who allowed me to pursue a full-time lab work as a, as a, and to give up my clinical responsibilities. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But you do still have that perspective, right? That yeah. So you, you can, don't. you can, you can say, <laughs> I don't see patients and, and certainly I don't take care of them, but the training that I received in the context of uh, physiology of human disease or pathophysiology right. of human disease right certainly informs the way I think about um, uh, infectious diseases and uh, auto, autoimmune diseases and otherwise. So it definitely has a heavy imprint on how I conduct science. And it gives you a certain authority. When you talk about the effect of Zika on the body, I can tell you're a doctor. You, you say all the words correctly, you use them correctly. Us PhDs, you know, we're, we're imposters when it comes to human disease. You really understand what's going on. I have a sense. I, I think... There could be sort of a level of authorita- authoritative usage of, of language, which may be good and may not be right, good. Right, right, of course. That said, I, I do have a sense of the process of pathogenesis because I've been studying it for a long time, but also Perfect. because I've seen it in, in action in humans. But, uh, you know, some people say things more definitively with less data. and Of course. That's not good either. No, but I, I know you and I know mm-hmm. uh, when I hear you, I, I just can tell that you speak with authority. And I find it uh, consoling. It's it's just very convincing. If I ask you a question, you respond with, uh, and I and I believe you. <laughs> now may, that may not be good. I don't know, but I think hopefully it's good. Uh, I think uh, it comes from that kind of of training, and I I think just for that, even if you never saw a patient, that would be worthwhile to have for a basic scientist, right? Also, we should point out WashU has a great crop of uh, virologists, right? Yes, we have an outstanding program of uh, I'll call them interdisciplinary virologists in this way. 
most of virology is not in the micro department any longer. We historically、mm-hmm. we had outstanding virologists who were in micro.、Uh, think people like Charlie Rice,、uh, mm-hmm. who won this year's Lasker Award. Congratulations, Charlie.、Um, Sonia Schlesinger, Milton Schlesinger.、Uh, we had、uh, a, um, a number of people. Who trained with them? Who became faculty members?、Um, and we still have we have virologists. Certainly, we've actually recruited a number of junior virologists. But Wash Washu is large and has a huge virology、uh, faculty presence in the p- departments of pathology and immunology,、uh, as well as in、um, department of medicine. So we actually have a large number of people like Skip Virgin, who's the chair of pathology and immunology, and Wen Yokoyama, who's a enkeso biologist who studies. Cytomegalovirus and innate immune system interactions, and Marco Colonna. These are people all outside、mm-hmm. microbiology, and David Fremont, who's a structural biologist who's interested in virology. So many of our、um, people who work on viral immunology problems really are doing it from outside of micro. But it's so interdisciplinary; it doesn't really departments aren't siloed, so we all interact quite well together, and we're all situated in the same space in the same area, so it's very easy、mm-hmm. to collaborate. So there you go. If you're looking for PhD programs, and you want to do virology, you have to look at Washu. And Missouri is not a bad place to live, right? No, you know I lived on the coast. I grew up in New York City. I、yeah. lived in Boston. Lived in San Francisco and Berkeley. And、uh, there are some things that doesn't have culturally some of the other places. Although there is a lot of cultural stuff to do, but it doesn't quite have the density. But、um, it is very easy to live in. Very easy to get around. It's not expensive, and the university is so outstanding. It, it, it、mm. basically any of the other shortcomings are really washed away. Right. Washed. I've been there fifteen years. Washed away at there Washu. You <laughs> All right. What I wanted to do to talk about two viruses that you work on. One of them, I would say, is the other besides dengue and Zika, chick chikungunya, because I've never really talked about that with anyone here on Twiv. Uh, and then, of course, we have to talk about Zika because you've had two、uh, new papers out since、um, we we talked at、uh, ASM in Washington D.C. So I'd like to touch on those today as well. So let's start with chikungunya.、Uh, what is it? Where did it come from? And where is it going? So chikungunya is a, an arthritogenic alpha virus. So、uh, alpha viruses are another arbovirus. They're、uh, in the Togaviridae family. And so these are single-stranded positive polarity RNA viruses. They have two open reading frames. They have a one long genomic open reading frame, and then they have a subgenomic open reading frame, which encodes the structural genes, so that、uh, after infection gets established, they can make lots of the subgenomic transcript, which then allows them to generate large amounts of viral proteins, which then、um, encapsulate at the membrane, and then they bud,、uh, much as like、uh, influenza would bud. So、uh, these viruses can replicate uh, relatively quickly. Uh, they're easy to grow in culture, and there's many of them uh, uh, that cause disease worldwide. Although、um, uh, chikungunya now has emerged as the leading alpha virus that causes disease, just because of its epidemic spread over the past、uh, several years.、Uh, related viruses that you may be aware of for arthrogen- arthritogenic ones are model ones like Cinbis.、Mm-hmm. Uh, which people study and is genetically very tractable and was one of the first viruses, I believe, one of the first viruses actually to be fully cloned and sequenced. I think、uh, Charlie actually may have done that. It was polio was the first. Oh,、one. I'm sorry. Charlie、That's、did、true. it shortly after I. There you go. <laughs> That's the only reason I know that. <laughs> maybe, maybe I set you up for that one.、Um, uh, in addition to Cinbis and、uh, Chikungunya virus, there's viruses like some leaky forest virus, which have been used to do uh, uh, wonderful model work on entries. Where people like Ari Helenius and Margaret Killian studied them for many years. A- and then there are、um, the、uh, emerging ones like Mayaro virus, which is now causing、uh, arthritis in,、uh, I think, in children in Central America. There was just some cases, I think, believe in Haiti that were reported. And also has been a problem in South America. Also mosquito transmitted. I will come back that, to that on Chick.、Um, and then、uh, it's very distantly related to the encephalitic alpha viruses, which we also started to work on because we work on viruses that enter into the central nervous system. Things like Eastern Venezuelan Western equine encephalitis viruses, which don't infect a huge number of people, but can be devastating if they do. People do get infected. So Chick、um, was a virus that.、Uh, Caused periodic epidemics here and there, but really、uh, were confined to regions of Africa uh, and uh, perhaps India and uh, uh, other parts of Asia. But in 2006, it emerged with much greater epidemic spread, which is now attributed 
for the most part, although I think there's still some questions in the field, to some mutation, a mutation that occurred in the envelope protein, in the E1 protein, which allowed it to replicate and transmit better in uh, 80s Alpapictus mosquitoes. So up until then, we had transmission in uh, Egypti. In Egypti, yeah. So so these the chikungunya is a arthritogenic alphavirus that is an arbovirus that's transmitted um, exclusively by, pretty much exclusively in its enzootic cycle uh, by mosquitoes. And so it's transmitted so it, well, by Egypti and now also Alpapictus. So... You know, Zika, we first learned about in 47. Was there a similar genesis of yes, the there's a. Yes, uh, I believe the first strain was from Tanzania, mm-hmm. um, but also Africa and about the same time. And if you look in historically, there mm. were a number of viruses that were identified in that post-World War II period. Um, I believe there was uh, labs that were set up, field labs that were set up with people interested in identifying them. Uh, it, so there's a number of viruses that were actually identified at that time, and Chick was identified then as well. And there were outbreaks in Africa and Asia, you said. Yes. Right? Yeah. I mean, w- but small the, scale. Small scale, even smaller than Zika or larger than Zika? I think larger than Zika. Okay. Now, is there an animal reservoir of chick? So um, there you can infect, there is a, a, a well, it, I'm not so sure we have all of the answers on that. Certainly mm-hmm. you can infect monkeys with it. Um, and there is some evidence that uh, there is uh, some sylvatic uh, uh, reservoir in some monkeys, probably mm. in Africa. I'm not. I don't think that in other parts of the world that's that has been established yet. Um, but primarily for epidemic transmission, certainly it's mosquito human, mosquito human okay. with okay. with this other mosquitoes probably in a sylvatic cycle in Africa. So uh, for for Zika, we suspect there's a monkey reservoir in Africa. Yes, yeah, so right? in fact, it was originally identified in monkeys. Mm-hmm. If you remember, there was a rhesus macaque that was identified in 1947, and it's felt to be to have a reservoir again in Africa, although even though it's moved into the Western Hemisphere, it's not clear there's a monkey reservoir yet in, in the yeah. Western Hemisphere. So for chick, we don't have as good serology that there that exists in monkeys in Africa, is that correct? Or Not that I'm aware of. You know, interestingly, that rhesus macaque is a, it's an Asian monkey, right? Mm-hmm. So it's a New World monkey. That's correct. And um, the, the reservoir in Africa obviously is not New World correct. Uh, monkeys, but that's just they, the way they it's put well. those monkeys there. Yeah, they, they weren't necessarily the monkeys that belonged there. That's right. But since then, people have taken serum from wild monkeys. Yes. They find antibodies to Zika, and maybe a little bit to chick, but not as as well studied as you said. Yeah, you know, the part of the problem with Zika is finding antibodies to Zika in areas where there's also endemic dengue, because mm-hmm. monkeys can get infected with dengue, and there's certainly sylvatic cycles of dengue as well, is that it is uh, historically challenging to separate out dengue and Zika remote from the infection. So I suspect that... Uh, there may be over or underestimates depending mm, upon what yeah, the issues I, are until sure. we work out better serologic tests. So my sense is I'm a little circumspect at this point in making a conclusions until we have better reagents to really distinguish them at the mm, diagnostic yeah, level, yeah. Okay. Uh, certainly in the uh, 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 endemic population where there's co-circulation. Right. Now, you said that the, the chick, uh, a, mu- a mutation was selected for better replication in albopictus. Mm-hmm. That was around 2006. Six. Is that associated with the big outbreak on Réunion? Yes. Okay, many, many thousands of people. And from that point on, it began to spread beyond where it was previously. Yeah, so it spread from there into back into parts of Africa. But really, the big epidemic site was in um, India, where Mm -hmm. millions of people Mm -hmm. were infected. And we really don't even have the full numbers of those. And then also, there was emergence into Italy, if you remember. Mm -hmm. Parts of Europe had infections, although not large numbers of cases, but certainly enough to create uh, some newsworthy nature and I wouldn't say panic, but certainly concern on the part that there was a exotic virus which could cause chronic persistent arthritis now emerging into the European theater, if you will. So um, this created a lot of interest at the time. In terms, and, in terms of disease, mainly an arthritic type disease? Yeah, so Chick uh, has uh, two types of disease, really. It causes in the acute and the chronic phase, and, and we don't fully still yet understand all of the details in terms of susceptibility to from one to another, but most people get an acute febrile illness who get it. And in fact, the attack rate is pretty high. So we think about attack rates in, in vi- viruses in the field, whereas uh, West Nile virus, the attack rate might be uh, 20%, meaning 20 to 30% of the people actually get symptoms. Uh, for chick, uh, the estimates that I've seen are between 60 and 90%, mm-hmm. depending on the region. Now, those numbers, you have to really compare 
follow longitudinally somebody, uh, does anybody remember getting an infection and then check them periodically for seroconversion? That's the way they come up with those numbers in, in the setting of an epidemic. Um, so most people get a, a febrile illness that lasts about a week to two weeks, but during that period of time, a majority of these people get bad muscle aches and bad joint pain with actual, in a subset of these people, get severe joint swelling. And But even those within about a, a month or so, most people clear and pretty much are back to normal. However, a subset, and that subset again varies depending on the study, the place, the time, but it can be up to like 20 to 30% even in some places can go on to chronic persistent arthralgia arthritis where they may have either just joint pain, they may have joint swelling, they may have what we call tenocytivitis, which is um, swelling of the... Um, uh, the ligaments and tendons in the area, um, and uh, they can get synovitis, which is just inflammation of the uh, the cells surrounding the joint, the cartilage. So they can get all of these different types of inflammation in the musculoskeletal area of the mm-hmm. joint, and that mm-hmm. can persist for weeks, months, and even years. And that's the one that can be, although it's not life-threatening, it certainly can be crippling and, and um, uh, can limit people's mobility. Mm-hmm. In fact, Chikungunya, the name, comes from the Makandi language and means that which bends up, and meaning that people have difficulty moving and extending right. their joints right. because of this chronic inflammatory process. So it's, it's not typically a fatal infection, but it can be tr- crippling. Right. However, um, there are some fatalities, mostly in uh, newborns who get mm-hmm. it, and, and people who are significantly immunocompromised. So they did see some fatalities and those seem to be associated with some sort of shock-like syndrome, although um, because the numbers are small, clinical histories have not been really studied in in, an exhaustive detail yet. And it's not sexually transmitted as far as we know. Correct. And it does not cross the placenta as far as we know in women. As far as we know, although the suspicion is you could probably get blood transfusion. Yes. But okay. Um, okay. I don't think it's been really monitored carefully because you do get a pretty high viremia with this. This is alpha viruses. And those are people who have worked with alphas and flavies. Alphas are great viruses to work with because they replicate so well. Mm-hmm. You get wonderful titers. And indeed, in, in even in humans, they get a nice, uh, for chick, they get a very high peak uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, viremia. Yeah. And of course, then it gets clear. So do you think this is a virus for which uh, a vaccine will be available at some point? So there were, um, there are, aside from the issues of producing a vaccine and testing the vaccine, I think from an immunogenicity standpoint, mm. um, there should be one. Uh, I, in fact, there was, and an NIH made one several years ago, Gary Nabel mm-hmm. had a Nature Medicine paper. It's now probably six years ago or so, something maybe about 2010 or 2011, I don't exactly remember, but um, where they made a virus-like particle. And that was highly immunogenic and protected mice and protected monkeys and looked quite good. Of course, making virus-like particles is costly. One can imagine a DNA plasmid vaccine might be useful. That wasn't tested. From the standpoint of immunogenicity, um, most of the chick stains are relatively related. There are different genotypes. There's mm-hmm. the East Central South African, the West African, and the Asian strains, but they do, there are polyclonal serum does cross neutralize well. And uh, uh, neutralizing antibodies can definitely protect against infection. So, I, from that standpoint, it should not be hard to make a chick vaccine. There was a chick vaccine that was made by the uh, Walter Reed mm-hmm. back in the 70s. It is a vaccine strain that we currently use as BSL2. I should point out that chick. Hot chick is BSL three, but um, the vaccine strain, which is called one eighty one slash twenty five, is a BSL two strain. It has mutations, uh, two sets of mutations that are primarily attenuating. One in the E two protein, which confers heparin sulfate binding, and another um, in, in another region, which is also is attenuating. And um, uh, that vaccine was given uh, certainly to humans and it was taken off the market largely because of reactogenicity Mm -hmm. is my understanding. So I think we could make a vaccine. The question is, um, who will pay for the vaccine and where will it be tested? So when you work with chick in the lab, do you use the vaccine strain? We use, uh, both. We have a a vaccine strain that we, if we're doing things that are high throughput that we want to do at BSL two, for some reason, we can certainly use the vaccine strain. Most of the work we use is with the BSL three strains. We have strains, 
uh, infectious clones from several of them that we have gotten from people in the field. I would say we did not make any clones. We got clones from Steve Higgs' group, Mark Heise's group, Tim Morrison's group. Uh, people have been very generous in the alpha virus field with their reagents. Uh, we've tried to do that with our antibodies as well. Um, and uh, there are a number of strains that are not cloned that people use as well that you can get at the um, uh, Bob Tesh's uh, uh, Arbo, uh, World Reference Arbovirus Collection at Galveston with appropriate paperwork. So uh, getting strains is not a problem. We work with many different strains. You, you must have a BSL-3 lab. Also. We do have a BSL-3 <laughs> lab. As, you, as you're aware, we work with many viruses uh, of different, of different uh, biosafety levels, and right. we do have BSL facilities for our chick. So back to the epi... Um, when did it reach the Western Hemisphere? So uh, we expected it to come at some point, you know, after we, meaning the field did. It was, their mosquitoes were present in uh, the New World. And uh, there was hints that Chick actually was here mm-hmm. before and, that, that it, and then was extinguished at some point. Um, if you, there was a, a review article that was written by Scott Halstead on this uh, where there was evidence that Chick might have been here, I believe, in the 19th century. Mm-hmm. And then... Um, so for whatever reason, extinguished. So whether it never was here before, I think there's ev- the, his suggestion is there was, but certainly it was gone. But clearly the mosquito vector was here and there was a naive population. So he, it was just a matter of time before it came here. And in fact, it did get here um, uh, about 2013 to 2014 and uh, caused a big outbreak in, um, uh, in different parts of South America as well as Central America, spread through Central America and millions of, Probably a couple of million people were infected, about 1.7 million mm-hmm. in about 40 different countries. And it came to the doorstep of the United States. Again, we can come back to this with Zika, but there was no local or what we call autochthonous transmission documented of chikungunya virus. It seemed to stopped at the doorstep and we had certainly traveler cases mm-hmm. right. and we still have traveler cases. We at WashU had cases from Haiti, people we had hmm. who were doing either medical missions or were going down there for research purposes, came back where right. they were able to isolate virus from them. So in that period of time from 2013 to 2014, it was a big thing and there was a significant concern. It became supplanted by Ebola. If you remember when yeah. where there was this big, <laughs> well, we have to take care of Chick. We're worried about Chick coming to the United States. And then Ebola hit and then everybody forgot Chick. And then Ebola weighing down, and then a Zika came, and we still forgot Chick. So Chick is still <laughs> percolating, causing infections um, uh, in in the Americas, although not quite at the same epidemic spread that we saw initially, um, uh, but has not spread further into the United States. And all this spread in South America, Caribbean also, right? Yes. Is Aedes aegypti vectored? Yeah, so the reason why is it is Aedes aegypti is because the virus that actually spread here was an Asian virus, and it was not the East Central South African La Reunion type virus, Mm. which had adapted to Aedes albopictus, but instead it was an Asian virus. Remember, it's one amino acid away. It could could get adapted. However, in the South South Central and America and then the Caribbean, there's plenty of Aedes aegypti, so there was really no reason for it to adapt and uh, that other Mm. virus to emerge as the dominant virus. And so it has stayed as uh, an Asian genotype using dominantly Aedes aegypti. I'm surprised that the Albopictus strain hasn't been brought over via travel and has established itself in the Pictus population in the U.S., for example. Yeah, it, it is somewhat surprising, although I will say that we have learned some stuff from the West Nile story, and this mm-hmm. is not my work, but work that I hear from people like Laura Kramer or Greg Ebel or others, that uh, not all, for example, West Nile is transmitted by Culex species, as you're aware, mm-hmm. And there's a number of ones that are important. There's Culex pipians and Culex tarsalis. And the ones in the new world may be slightly different than the ones in the old world. Sure, sure, and so sure. there could be differences between, I suspect, between our albopictus ones, or it could just be the virus just didn't get here and didn't get established for whatever reason. Have, I, I have, don't know that we know. Have people tried to infect our albopictus mosquitoes with the, the variant and seen if it does as well as uh, albopictus from Asia? So I suspect they must have, but to yeah. be honest with you, I don't recall a study yeah, yeah. that has done that with field mosquitoes. Whether, you know, may, maybe there are laboratory mosquitoes, but yeah, I think yeah, key, right. the question that people like to do this with now is with field-based mosquitoes. So I don't know whether they've done it. If it's been done, I would imagine that maybe somebody like Scott Weaver at yeah. Galveston yeah. or Laura would have done it, but I don't recall a publication. So the original uh, establishment of a one amino acid change in the glycoprotein Letting it 
grow better in albopictus. That was done in laboratory reared mosquitoes. Yes, that was. Probably yeah. cell lines and then mosquitoes yeah. as well. And in fact, I think it, at the time there was some criticism that, oh, well, this might be a laboratory artifact. But I think that for the most part, it's been borne out, born out to okay. be true. All right. But that was a concern. Well, now, of course, everyone's forgotten about Chick again with Zika. Until next time. Until next time, perhaps. Um, but one last thought. I mean, is it, it hasn't spread, as you said, autochthonously in the U.S., and Zika has barely spread, you know, 140 cases or so. What's the likelihood that Chick will? Who knows, right? We don't know. I mean, the, the reason I think chick might is because it can replicate to very high titer in humans and mm-hmm. uh, the transmission cycle, the epidemic force is very high, meaning that uh, uh, because they're viremic for a period of time with high viremia, the mosquitoes can get infected and move it around. Um, however, the, you have to have the, both mosquitoes and infected humans in the same place. Yeah, yeah. And that is an issue for humans in the United States because we tend to try to avoid mosquitoes at, at most cost, meaning our, <laughs> we try to keep our houses away from yeah, uh, close yeah. to them and our cars. And I think that is really what limits um, uh, the same type of mosquito transmission cycles that we see in endemic areas. Okay. And one last word. Remember, chick is not a flavivirus. A lot of people think so. They just lump it with Zika and dengue. But. They do, and in fact, on some of the diagnostics <laughs> that have come out with um, uh, that for uh, diagnostic grants that have come out, people have been trying to generate um, uh, multiplex diagnostic reagents against chick, dengue, and Zika. And people who are not arboviruses virologists or not virologists in general say, "Well, you know, well, should I worry about the cross reactivity between chick and mm. Zika?" And of course, you have to remind them that they're completely different viruses, and there is no cross reactivity right. to speak right. of. I was on a. I'm on the Institutional Biosafety Committee of Columbia. Yesterday, we had a meeting, and someone's lab is working on. They wrote Flavy viruses, chikungunya, and some other. And someone said, "Why would they say Flavy and chick? Isn't that redundant?" I said, "No, they're <laughs> different families. <laughs> it's not redundant. So, even within Columbia." So are you still working on Chick or have yes. you completely diverted? So we, we've been working on, we have a couple of stories on Chick that are in the process. We still are working on antibody uh, mm-hmm. related stories. We actually have a, a story um, related with uh, combination therapies, uh, looking at both uh, antibody related therapies against antiviral therapies and also immunomodulatory therapies to mitigate arthritis. It's a story that we've um, uh, just just about completed. And we also are working on chick in the context of trying to understand the immunologic basis of acute arthritis right. in animal models. Uh, we have some studies looking at entry pathways, and we also have some studies looking at interactions with other alpha viruses in terms of cross-reactive B cell responses. Mm-hmm. So you suspect the arthritic is is in part an, an immune reaction. You know, I I I think that the certainly the chronic part and the acute part is initially viral mediated, and then the viral PAMPs drive uh, innate immune responses, which then drive inflammation, of which CD4 T cells contribute, probably inflammatory monocytes. And the key question is, as you go further out, what's driving the chronic arthritis? There is chronic viral RNA present, Mm -hmm. not much infectious virus, if any. So really understanding the immunologic basis of that is going to direct how you want to treat it. You think the RNA is stimulating innate responses in the chronic phase? We don't know for certain, but my guess is that having an RNA an RNA pamp around for a long time <laughs> probably does that. But uh, yeah. that's my guess. I have to say that it is not with a lot of data that I make that guess. Right. Got it. That's fine. That's what guesses are for, to check, right? All right. Let's turn to Zika. I'd like to talk about your paper that came out this week um, on finding replication in testes. And then um, a little bit further back, but... Since our last TWIV, uh, the the replication in the eye and present uveitis and tears and so forth. And today at your talk, you gave a wonderful, very short uh, summary of the pathogenesis of Zika. Maybe you could do that again, starting with the, the mosquito bite. What, what happens? Right. Well, I will say that this is the pathogenesis as we have learned from the mouse. And so, of course. <laughs> so uh, certainly in humans we can draw some parallels where we have to be a little cautious about right. about that but what our what with our thought is is that uh, and, and we some of this we're extrapolating from our long standing study with other flaviviruses but a mosquito uh, would inoculate the virus into the skin largely these mosquitoes are not so great at getting it directly in the bloodstream although some can get in the blood but a lot of it can dump, get dumped into the skin there's a local uh, immune reaction that occurs probably 
um, uh, dendritic cells, ker- uh, the keratinocytes may be involved as well, and Langerhans cells. The virus then probably is brought to the lymph node uh, by dendritic cells, infects some local cells there, which then stimulates an immediate round of innate immunity and also um, uh, releases chemo- chemotractin factors, which drive recruitment of immune cells. There's more further rounds of replication, and then the virus uh, gets into the bloodstream at higher levels, and then you see distant organs. And for um, for Zika, what we have seen is that the virus seeds seeds to go to a number of different organs that maybe not all flaviviruses go to. For example, um, in in pregnant women, it it goes to the placenta, which is uh, fetal derived. In um, in adults, males, it goes to the testes. Uh, we've also seen it go to the eyes, uh, and it can go to the brain and to the spinal cord as well. Although that is seen with other flavi- neurotropic flaviviruses, mm-hmm. uh, and for Zika in adults, it doesn't normally do that, although it can do that. It also goes to the kidney, and that's been seen with some other flaviviruses like West Nile and St. Louis encephalitis virus. Um, and then um, subsequently, the virus induces a, an adaptive uh, B cell response, an IgM and IgG response, which clears it from the uh, the serum uh, and uh, blood component. But you really require probably a T cell component to actually get it rid, get it out of cells. But the problem for Zika is that it is now moving into places that are what we call immune sanctuary sites, and so those sites are ones that are not readily accessible by cellular immunity. And so unless something happens, meaning there's wide-scale inflammation or damage, uh, the cellular immune responses are not supposed to be able to cross into those areas. So then the virus can persist for periods of time. And so this is what we see in the eye, for example, as well as in the testes. uh, And we're certainly looking in other regions as well. And then, of course, in the fetus, the the virus gets into the placenta and actually infects the barrier cells. And so we've shown and others have shown both in, in vitro models, organoid models, as well as um, uh, primary cell culture models that the virus can infect um, tr- different types of trophoblasts. It can also infect um, the macrophages in the fetus. These are called the Hoff-Bauer macrophages, which are important for the fetus uh, acting as barrier function, uh, as well as uh, probably fetal endothelial cells. And you get local replication in the placenta, which then can go through the uh, fetal endothelial cells and then see distant sites in the central nervous system. And Zika seems to for some reason, in addition to other cells that it targets, it targets stem cells or progenitor cells. And this has been a problem in the fetus. It targets the neuroprogenitor cells. And then by doing that, it can actually infect and either cause injury, and which can prevent them from differentiating the way they're supposed to, or kill them worse, uh, which then leaves a hole in the, in the neuroprogenitor cell. And then if it kills enough of them, then you're not able to differentiate into appropriate neurons or glial cells, and then you get this cortical thinning process that mm-hmm. occurs. Mm-hmm. And so that's a problem. And in fact, in, in our study most recently, when we looked at the testes, we also saw it seem to be infecting the, the sperm stem cells. Mm-hmm. Now, right. whether it's right. going to be infecting other stem cells or not, I don't know. And why it's infecting these stem cells relative to other flaviviruses, this is a question yeah. that we're really interested in answering. I mean, could be many things. Could be a receptor. It could be an intracellular issue. Or, right. Who knows? Absolutely. Now, in your mouse model, which you described a while ago, these are basically immunosuppressed. They either lack the type 1 interferon receptor or you give them antibodies to the receptor. And you described in that first paper, they don't actually, the mice, or the fetuses don't have microcephaly. They have an overall growth retardation. Correct. Right? So uh, there have been a number of studies now, uh, in addition to our original study, that have created somewhat uh, diff- uh, variations on the model and get slightly different disease. But in our model, uh, we um, either used IFNAR knockout moms and wild-type dads mm-hmm, to create mm-hmm. an IFNAR het um, uh, fetus. We tried to do that so that the fetus at least would be relatively immunocompetent, but we needed to have an IFNAR mom so the virus would get to the placenta so you could get local infection and viremia because we were not putting the virus intravenously. We were putting it right. in, in the in the skin. Um, we also use a blocking antibody to interfere on, which we can administer to the mom and then presumably um, the, some of it may transport across to the fetus, although um, fetuses actually uh, in the mouse have low levels of neonatal FC receptor, mm-hmm. much lower than humans do. So actually there's a, uh, a much lower level that actually transport across. We don't know how much is across or not for the mouse antibodies. We actually have more recently measured this for human antibodies, but not but not for mouse. So we, we don't know that answer y- yet. Um, so... Uh, in in other people have used other models where they've 
directly infected, the brains. I think we had discussed this on yeah, a, a yeah. last time. So there are a number of different models. And then more recently, um, uh, Akiko Osaki's group has done an intervaginal model where they've been able to infect intervaginally and then watch the virus sort of move up the female reproductive mm-hmm. tract and then infect um, pr- uh, in pregnant uh, mice and then infect the placenta. That Right, right. So in humans, is, are some of the infected babies born, do they have growth retardation? Or Yeah, so um, that was the question. So... Uh, yeah, so in our model, we primarily saw placental insufficiency because of placental infection and placental damage. In humans, while microcephaly is certainly seen, um, and uh, certainly we've seen a lot in Brazil, if you, in the uh, perspective study, that the perspective longitudinal study that was done, um, that was published in the New England Journal, they also saw evidence of placental insufficiency. Mm-hmm. So some babies had growth defects more generally, whereas others had dominantly head growth defects. Okay. So uh, just this week, you published a paper, Zika virus infection damages the testes in mice. Tell us why you did that and right. wh- what you did and what you found. So um, we started to study this because of uh, basically two observations. One was that uh, we knew there was sexual transmission in humans and we knew that there was virus and viral RNA in semen and sperm. The sperm we knew more recently, but there was clearly viral RNA in semen and there was transmission. That was one observation. The second one was we knew in the mice from our initial study that we could detect uh, viral RNA at least uh, long-term in the testes. So we, we asked the simple question, okay, we know there's transmission and we know there's virus in the male reproductive tract. What is the consequence of that? Is there a consequence? In other words, we're focusing on transmission, which is important, obviously, for transmitting the virus to pregnant women or women who want to become pregnant and create problems for congenital malformations. But is there any consequence to the man Mm -hmm. or to the male? And so what we did was basically a very straightforward longitudinal study where we infected animal, wild type animals had been treated with a single dose, a low dose of interferon antibody to allow viremia to occur to then seed the testes. And then we followed them to see what would happen at 7, 14, 21, 35, 48, 40, 41 to 45 days, and then evaluated uh, the consequences both at the histological level, the virological level, as well as um, um, uh, functional level for um, reproductive tract physiology. In addition, we did some other side experiments to see what the role of the adaptive immune response was by using rag mice. And we also explored whether Axel was involved because Axel is a putative entry receptor and whether this was critical for infection in the testes. So you found what? We found uh, that um, within the first week, there was high levels of virus and viral RNA in the infectious virus and viral RNA in the testes. Mm-hmm. Um, and most of it was actually in spermatogonium stem cells as well as spermatogonium and also in Sertoli cells, which are the cells that are trophic for the sperm and also important Mm. to uh, sustain the blood testes barrier, which is what limits the immune system from uh, adventitiously tracking in and targeting Mm. uh, maturing sperm. So that was the first thing we saw. At that time, about one week after infection, we saw some immune, uh, some infiltrating uh, CD45 positive immune cells coming in, but they were localized to the interstitium where Leydig cells reside, but there was no evidence of damage to the testes. And in fact, by histology, you could not distinguish uh, an infected animal from an uninfected animal just by H&E staining. Mm-hmm. The only the way to do it would be to look by immunofluorescence and you could only see CD45 positive cells being different. Other than that, they looked virtually identical. Even though there was high level of virus, we had about seven to nine logs of viral RNA in the testes per gram. And we also had six to eight logs of infectious virus, mm-hmm. placable virus, real virus, as we would say. <laughs> and that was remarkable. I did not expect to see that much virus in the testes at day seven with very little consequence. Right. But of course, that much virus can take its toll on an organ, especially if you're a cytolytic virus. And uh, while it's not cytolytic for every cell, uh, certainly we we were concerned about it. And so we followed the uh, the animals out um, and we looked at animals at day 14 and day 21. And by even by day 14, there was significant damage to the seminiferous tubules. These are the tubules, which um, are the architectural uh, location for maturing sperm. And we saw evidence of, uh, of 
destruction of the Sertoli cells. We saw evidence of uh, infiltration of immune cells. And we also saw breakdown of the blood testes barrier at day 14. And by day 21, it was even worse. And by day 21, the testes had in the mice had involuted such that their weight, the average weight of a testy was about 10% of normal, which means it basically had shrunken, mm. presumably because of the collapse of the architecture and then also because of the loss of the old sperm that were moving down and that not generating the new sperm due to death. That, that would be my guess, although I, I don't have a full explanation for that. And uh, at that point in time, at day 21, there's, uh, there was clearly a lot, of dis- lot of damage and destruction. Yeah, the picture you showed of the normal testis and the infected is very striking. Yeah, and what my uh, students um, uh, and my uh, uh, research associates, uh, uh, the first author, Jen Guevara, and, and, and others in my laboratory, they remarked consistently in those animals that it was very difficult to find the testes. Normally, mm-hmm. you can find them readily, but you had to look a little bit because they became sort of grains of rice, yeah. that size. Yeah. And so yeah. they became very small. It was not noticeable, not not, not noticeable. It was definitely consistent throughout and always associated with Zika infection and not with the uninfected animals. So uh, can these mice recover from this involution or is it permanent? Right. So we looked at day 45 or so, between day 41 and day 48, we looked at a bunch of mice by histology. First of all, the the, the testes were still small. They hadn't gotten bigger again. And the second mm-hmm. point is that we looked by histology and we saw the same destruction. So even three weeks later, there was really nothing going on. And uh, I from conversations from my collaborators, especially um, Kelly Moley, who's the other senior co-author on the paper, who's a um, uh, OBGYN who works on issues of fertility, she has told me that this kind of extensive damage is mm-hmm. not really repairable um, uh, because you're killing the stem cells and the Sertoli cells, which are the two yeah. key cells yeah. that, that are going to really help you create the seminiferous tubule structure. And in fact, um, uh, when we looked later on, we didn't see it. Now, we are planning to look longitudinally even further out, although in order to finish the paper, we had to use up most of the animals um, to address some reviewer questions, <laughs> as well as to really make sure that we knew what was going on. So we have to sort of start from yeah. scratch, and we have new cohorts that are planned to be infected. Are you going to try mating the infected males with females to see if they can transmit it? So we did do that, not for that reason, but we did that to address the question of fertility. And the reason why is when mm-hmm. we had this mm-hmm. issue of um, destruction of the seminiferous tubules, we looked to see if the sperm count started to drop. And in fact, motile sperm dropped, plummeted. In fact, we had levels of motile sperm. These are That would mean live sperm that can swim out uh, down to levels of 10% or even less in mm-hmm. some of the mm-hmm. animals. And associated with this were low reproductive hormone levels. Uh, the levels of testosterone dropped, although only by a few fold because testosterone is made by the Leydig cells, which are not targeted by the virus. Uh, uh, but the levels of inhibin B, which are made by the Sertoli cells, which are all important for the trophic functions of uh, maturing sperm, uh, those levels drop more significantly. And then we took those animals that had been out several weeks, and then we mated them and took aged matched males that were just right out of the box from Jax and ma- mated them with uh, females for five days. We did one-on-one mating um, with each of these, and we did it multiple times, multiple independent times. And... Uh, um, we saw decreased rates of fertility um, uh, and also decreased sizes of the litters. Now, it wasn't that there was no fertility. Even with those low levels, some of the males were able to um, uh, uh, generate uh, um, uh, females that were uh, induce females to become pregnant. They were able to, uh, to uh, um, get the females pregnant. Um, but on average, it was significantly lower. You don't need a lot of sperm mm-hmm. to actually mm-hmm. get a female pregnant. I think we all have some appreciation for that, that, uh, that sort of built-in excess, if you will, for the sur- for s- uh, survivalship of the, of, the, uh, of the species, if you will. So you only need a, a, a subset to actually work and swim up and actually complete the cycle, if you will. Uh, but you know, we had such large drops that we could actually see decreases in fertility. Yeah, sure. So sure. Uh, we called this um, oligospermia, which mm-hmm. means few sperm. Uh, and it's associated with fertility defects. However, there is still some fertility even in these um, severely in, uh, infected and uh, damaged animals. But you didn't look for virus in the females, right? In the females, um, uh, to see if we could transmit it. Yeah. No, yeah. we didn't. We we, we looked a, we looked at I think for virus in the pups mm-hmm. that had that that were conceived, right? Right. Uh, and we didn't see it, but we only looked at a small number, so it's not necessarily representative. So we really need to do a 
larger job, and we didn't look at the females. The question is, is whether those that far out, whether those males were going to be able yeah, to transmit. Yeah, right. And the second question is, if could a infected sperm actually uh, lead to an embryo generation, or would it never get up? Never, it would be compromised in its ability to swim, and would be outcompeted by a but uninfected. There, but there could be sperm in uh, semen, which is not cell associated, Correct. which could infect. Yes, I'm just, absolutely. I'm just looking for a model of sexual transmission. That's right. all. Yeah, so so we didn't look at that model for sexual yeah. transmission. Of course, the model that Akiko Iwasaki generated and published in Cell a, a month or two ago was she was inje- uh, yeah. just injected yeah. or squirted the virus in, a reasonable amount of virus, and then showed that the vaginal right. mucosa could take it up and then in a pregnant woman get the, get get, get uh, infection during pregnancy. I'm just curious if there's enough virus in semen to infect because, you know, Akiko's experiments artificially injected a lot of virus right. because in people... You know, the, the the rate of sexual transmission is very low. Correct. 1%, Correct. roughly. Correct, that's what it's estimated at. And people also have virus in other fluids, mm-hmm. in saliva, yep. uh, tears. Yep. So how do you know where it's coming from during sex, right? That's it's something I'm still not clear on. Right. right? And is so is it is it really the sperm or is it the seminal fluid? I think yeah. many people think it might be the seminal fluid. Right. Uh, right. That may have higher levels, but we don't know yet. So, so, so one way to get at that is yep. to do in vitro fertilization mm-hmm. and see whether you can actually yeah. fertilize an egg with an infected sperm if you can sure. identify sure. it that way. But um, I think more studies are going to need to be done yeah, to address the, your question. Now, when your paper came out, the headline said, Zika may cause male sterility, <laughs> right? So what would need to be done to figure out if that can happen? Right. So um, I, I appreciate the... Uh, some summary. However, we were very careful ab- about this. Uh, we tried to be careful in the title, in the abstract, as well as in the conclusion. We pointed out that this was exclusively performed in mice. Sure, sure. And so, and we even suggested in the abstract, as well as in the conclusion, that longitudinal studies in humans need to be performed to evaluate whether the finding that we see in mice is seen in humans and at what frequency. Right. So what needs to be done, right now, my understanding of what is being done for testing males is they're collecting sperm and they're uh, looking for viral RNA or infectious virus. Most Mm -hmm. people are looking for viral RNA. They take the sperm, they put it in some um, uh, denaturing buffer like uh, RLT buffer from Kyogen or whatever it may be, uh, guanidinium isothiocyanate variant, and uh, do TACMAN-based analysis. Mm -hmm. But what needs to be done to address our question is a couple of things. One is is to follow men longitudinally who are positive and see whether their sperm counts stay the same and whether their sperm mobility stays the same, as well as to do a detailed questionnaire to see whether they would have any symptoms uh, that would be consistent with reduction in sex hormones, meaning do they express show fatigue, have they had a loss in their libido, their sex drive, their performance, otherwise. And so these things could be handled um, at, at questions. And then if necessary, we could measure hormone levels. There are good tests, clinical mm-hmm. tests to do that, in addition to measuring sperm counts. And look for, I think, first in the men who are showing persistent infection. And if it turns out that some of those men are actually having these symptoms, then we're going to have to go back and revisit whether men who seroconverted, who didn't even have symptoms, could have seeded their testes and whether they possibly could also have this as well. So we don't really know, but right, the right. point is, is this has to be looked at and uh, we're trying to be cautious, but we're also trying to say that it is possible that this occurs. Certainly we can see it in the mouse. All right. So the, the last thing you said, we're not sure even if you have to be symptomatic or not after infection to get an alteration in, in, the, in the sperm. Now, the mouse testes are 10% of the size of uninfected mice. Could you see that in a human? Because that's something that's non-invasive, right? right? You could measure that. So one issue, and I talked to um, my colleague, Kelly Moly, about this, is we don't know whether this would play out exactly the same way in loss of size. It sure, may just sure. be that's the mouse, and the mouse thing collapses, and it collapses to a very small amount. So it might be more subtle. And so it could, instead of being 10%, it could be 50%, and that may be challenging to sort of do. Yeah, the other sure, issue is sure. is whether men are as um, vigilant about their health, if you will, in the same way that you know, we think about women who do breast exams yeah, yeah, on sure, themselves sure. Uh, rather frequently because there's been big um, uh, public awareness campaigns mm-hmm, to do mm-hmm. self-exams to make sure that they don't feel any nodules and if they do, to go seek medical attention. The question is, are men doing the same thing? And I think the experience from 
testicular cancer, mm-hmm. which is yeah. where you yeah. might feel yeah. a lump or a nodule or something that's uh, 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 out of whack, the size or the um, shape is wrong. Sure. We sure. don't detect that well. And normally that's detected uh-huh. by doctors who are doing those exams right. rather than by the patient. So the question is, how aware are men about this and could they really sense yeah. if there were differences? Yeah. Or not? I think if there's a public awareness campaign, we will start to see it if this is really going to happen. But I'm not so sure yeah. uh, retrospectively whether people are really looking to do this. Because I think a biopsy is going to be hard to get. No, no. I think a biopsy <laughs> would, would be very hard to get unless there was really good cause to do it. Exactly yeah. right. But I mean, you have all of these non-invasive ways, sperm analysis, hormonal analysis, yeah. Yeah. to really probably make the diagnosis uh, or to make the likely diagnosis independent of really invasive measures. By the way, could you do a transurethral biopsy of the testis? Is that possible? can do a transurethral biopsy of the prostate. I know that, right. I don't right. know about the testis. testis. Yeah, you'd have they, to go right in with it. Yeah, needle. I think so. Very I, few people are going to... Yeah, I, I think that... Um, and, and in fact, um, I don't know if it was one of the reviewers or a comment that I got from someplace when I discussed it was, why don't you just biopsy a bunch of men? And of course, that's yeah, not right, going to happen right. with any frequency. <laughs> yes. I mean, you know, and, and obviously there's there are always risks with any biopsy and this is a sensitive area. So in the mice, uh, the inv- the testicular involution is this bilateral? Uh, was not always bilateral, but for the most part, it was bilateral. Yes, okay. in other words, it, but it was asymmetric. So sometimes we saw one testis smaller than the other. The other was smaller than normal, mm-hmm. but one might be fifty percent, one might be ten percent, one might be thirty, one might be twenty. The further out you went, the more yeah. even it got. But there was asymmetry. This, this is important to sort out because we've been saying up till now for men, Zika is okay. Don't worry about it. Just don't have sex with someone when if you're potentially infected. But this puts a whole other dimension onto it, right? It, it potentially does. But of course, I want to point yeah, out that sure. potential. <laughs> potentially. I mean, if it results in sterility, this, yeah. this is, a, is a big issue. What fraction of men who are infected either symptomatically or asymptomatically with Zika have virus in semen? Do we know that? We don't know that yet. We don't know that at all. These these are studies that are following longitudinal studies now, but there's no data on that now. If you look in the publications that have come out, we don't know about asymptomatics to symptomatics, right. whatever. All right. So I tweeted that I was talking to you today. I got a couple of questions from people. Lisa Lisa Schnering, who's at uh, SIDRAP, that University of Minnesota publication on infectious disease. Are there any anecdotal clinical reports any plans for studying the impact on infected patients, which we just talked about. But I don't think there's any anecdotal. Well, there are anecdotal reports of uh, men who have been associated have hematospermia. That's right. And Correct. they've had uh, pain right. in the region, in the GU region. Um, so there is some evidence that something is going on mm-hmm. in the male uh, reproductive tract area, although it's not uh, clear anatomically and histologically if that's what we're seeing is the same thing. Okay. Now, Marion Koopmans from Erasmus Medical Center said, the current advice says condoms are abstinence, abstinence after return from an endemic region. Is there a way to profile transmission risk? The only way to profile transmission risk, I would guess, is if the man, if the man was actually tested, first of all, are they Zika positive? Right. Do they, did they seroconvert? Mm-hmm. Uh, presuming they're not immunosuppressed. And then the second would be, if you really wanted to know, then you would have to donate a sperm sample probably more than one to be yeah, certain yeah. and then check to see whether there was viral RNA in the sperm sample. Outside of that, I think we're left with condoms and abstinence. Right. All right. So you mentioned uh, antibody. So this is hard to do a good serology test, which would distinguish Zika from chick. Any other viruses cross-react? Not chick, um, dengue. Any other viruses cross-react? Well, it does cross-react to uh, West Nile and okay. yellow fever, but it, their distance of so the level of cross-reactivity is less, okay. so the major concern is really dengue. So right now, you have serum from some patient. The test cannot distinguish between, unless you do PCR, which is only during the acute period. Correct. You can't distinguish between dengue and Zika very well. Right. Unless they're um, dengue naive, then there's a Zika, I, a Zika IgM positive, dengue IgM negative is mm-hmm. probably going to be um, Zika. Okay. The problem happens in the convalescent phase when they're just IgG positive, and then it's very difficult to tell. Classically, you would do a neutralization assay, and it turns out that fusion loop antibodies, which are the highly cross-reactive antibodies, mm-hmm. they, neut- they neutralize dengue well. They don't neutralize Zika at all, and so it might look like you have a lot of dengue neutralization and a lot of Zika neutralization if you had a Zika 
um, response that was had a component of cross reactivity. So it becomes very difficult to tell just by a, fun- a functional test. I think that there is a huge effort underway by the diagnostic companies as well as by academic labs to try to generate reagents which can distinguish them. And I've heard anecdotally that there are uh, new targets that people are doing or modified proteins or modified mm-hmm. particles yeah. to try to address yeah. this, but obviously this will take a little bit of time. Right. I, I would expect that it'll happen eventually because things move very quickly. They do move field. quickly in the Zika field. A lot of people are interested in yes. bringing their expertise and so forth. Uh, the other paper, you pr- published Zika virus infection in mice causes pan-uveitis with shedding of virus in tears. It's the same mouse model. Same mouse model, yes. You infect in the same way, subcutaneous. Same way, right? yes. And why did you look in the eye? Why did we look in the eye? We looked in the eye because of two reasons, really. One, well, three reasons. One, we knew that um, in during microcephaly, associated with microcephaly, several of the newborn infants had eye disease, mm-hmm. and it was it was papers published in um, JAMA Ophthalmology. Uh, from a Brazilian cohort showing that there was damage to the retina uh, as well as to the sensory pathway, the neurons innervating the eye. Mm-hmm. And that had been shown in a couple of the fetal um, uh, uh, fetal analysis, those fetuses that unfortunately were associated with, with um, uh, miscarriage. So that was one piece of the puzzle. The second piece of the puzzle was that we also knew that in adults, 15 to 20% of the symptomatic Zika patients get conjunctivitis. Now, conjunctivitis can mean a lot of things. But as we know from people who get adenovirus and Coxsackie virus, there can be infection in the anterior chamber of the eye. The eye is divided into the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber before the, where the lens is and behind it where the retina is. And so we thought, well, maybe that conjunctivitis is due in part to direct infection. And then the third issue was we also knew from studies with Ebola and other pathogens that viruses can go into the eye and stay there because it's an immune sanctuary site. Mm-hmm. So for all those three reasons, we decided to take a look at the eye. And in people, conjunctivitis is part of the, the Zika syndrome, Yes, right? part, of, part of the Zika syndrome. About 15 to 20% of the patients get a significant conjunctivitis. And do we know in, in humans whether there's virus in tears or not? We now do. Not when we started the, the, the study, we didn't. Okay. But now, uh, subsequently, it's been reported that they've been able to recover at least viral RNA and there's one suspected tear transmission uh, 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 case hmm. uh, so far, though it, I'm not totally validated, but that is the most suspected mode of transmission. Yeah, so close contact without sex, that could be it, right? Correct. This was the transmission from a father to a son. Yeah. Father was hospitalized, I believe, and then there was no other, and he was cleaning him and uh, very close contact with him, cleaning his eyes and things like that. And so the thought is that might have been the contact um, um a point. So in your mouse study, you found virus in tears. Correct. Right? But not just RNA, but infectious viruses. So um, we found certainly infectious virus in the eye and when we made eye homogenates and we were right. able to transmit that virus uh, to um, highly immunocompromised, even more immunocompromised mice. We uh, found uh, viral RNA, substantive levels of viral RNA. But when we took that viral RNA, which we harvested rather late, um, we tried to transmit that um, and we were not able to show that that virus was infectious. Okay. We could only show that the viral there was viral RNA in tears, and there was infectious virus in the eye. Uh, uh, but and that could be that was transmissible. Okay. And where in the eye cells is the virus replicating? So we looked by um, uh, immunohistochemistry and primarily by in situ hybridization. Um, uh, I will say just parenthetically that our studies have been really helped by the new techniques in ISH. I, I don't know about you, but we tried this about a decade ago or f- with West Nile virus and it was difficult and the signal wasn't good. We used to use the digoxygenin probes mm-hmm. and, yeah, and yeah. you got like <laughs> nothing. Or maybe if you're lucky, you got a couple spots. But the new um, uh, classes of in-situ hybridization probes that have been generated by a number of companies are far better. Mm-hmm. And the signal is just great. And you can use uh, sections where you can actually retain the anatomy. So it's not like uh, you're yeah, dealing yeah. with frozen sections, but uh, what you're looking at the biconfocal, but actually these are, you can stain with a, a stain and actually get some architecture. And so we've been able to use those. So, um, uh, so we've certainly been aided by that technical advance, I think, in the field. So when we looked, we were able to see viral uh, RNA in the retinal uh, cells and the and the bipolar ganglion cells, as well as in 
um, uh, the neurons that are actually conveying the information back to the brain, as well as in other cell types as well. So multiple cell types within the eye showed, uh, showed infection. Mm. And we saw particular infection and inflammation in the uvea, which is sort of the, the, member, the, the cellular layer that surrounds both the anterior and the posterior part, such that we had both uveitis in the anterior chamber and in the posterior chamber, hence the term panuveitis. Right. So it's interesting that um, first Ebola virus, now Zika. There are other viruses that get into the eye. Yeah, West Nile actually gets into the eye and uh, was documented uh, early on in the epidemic. There was a number of reports of it and descriptions in the ophthalmology literature. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, uh, parenthetically another reason why we decided to look. But of course, not every virus does. Correct. So again, it's an interesting property that remains to be sorted out. Now for West Nile, isn't it true that it can also get in urine via the kidney, right? Yes. Uh, it, it, classically, it's not as much as another virus that's related to it that we don't study too much anymore called St. Louis encephalitis virus, which mm-hmm. was initially detected in the urine at high levels uh, and has been shown in animal models as well. Some of this work's been done at Galveston by Bob Tesh's group. Um, uh, West Nile also is uh, in the urine at, uh, and at longer periods of time than it is in, in the blood. Mm-hmm. And we don't really fully understand. There is some histology that suggests that some of the kidney cells, the renal cells, are infected, but we still don't fully understand the mechanism. And for Zika, it's in the kidney as well, although we, again, have not yet really pursued which cells are, are actually responsible for that. Right. Let me take a moment here to tell listeners about the sponsor of this episode, Curiosity Stream. It's the world's first ad-free, non-fiction streaming service. They have over 1,500 titles, 600 hours of content. And they were founded by John Hendricks, who started Discovery Channel. So you're guaranteed access to real science shows. You can watch these uh, films on your web browser or on any of those appliances that connect the internet to your TV, like Apple TV or Roku. You can get it in 196 countries. What they have is a wide variety of science, technology, nature, history, documentaries, interviews, lectures, all good stuff. For example, Stephen Hawking's favorite places. He pilots a fantastical CGI spaceship across the universe, stopping off at the places that he thinks are really cool. How neat is that? Uh, Another one called Digits. This is a three-part series hosted by Derek Mueller, who's creator of the Veritasium Science Channel on YouTube. And the series features interviews that have never been aired before with Ed Snowden and Vince Cerf. Everyone knows Edward Snowden. Vince Cerf, of course, co-founder of the uh, internet. Uh, Deep Time History, a three-part series on the 14-billion-year history of the universe. Underwater Wonders of the National Parks. A lot of cool stuff. They also have a pretty big 50-hour ultra-high-definition library, 4K, uh, which you can see as well, and that's growing as well. Now they have monthly and annual plans, uh, and they give you a lot of savings if you take a year out at a time. They start at $2.99 a month, less than a cup of coffee, or the cost of a single title on competing platforms. Check out curiositystream.com slash microbe. Use the promo code microbe when you sign up to get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series completely free for the first 60 days. That's two entire months free of one of the largest nonfiction 4K libraries around. Just go to curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the offer code microbe at sign up. This is a thought kind of experiment. My view of viruses the, uh, viruses getting into the CNS or the fetus is that it's a dead end for the virus because you can't transmit to another host. And in the end, that's the driver for evolution of viruses, transmission. So, you know, West Nile polio, I think the CNS is a dead end. It's an accident. It's part of the property of the virus. It happens to replicate in the right cells so it can get in. I think the same thing is for a fetus because I don't think fetuses, even babies born, are not much involved in transmission. You th- what do you think about that? I, I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, I, I, somebody asked me that earlier today, uh, perhaps was one of the students. But um, as you said, the virus's goal, and you have to be careful not to anthropomorphize viruses, <laughs> but right. really from a standpoint of transmission, all it needs for these arboviruses is viremia, Correct. something to cause enough viremia. Mm-hmm. Or it would have to be, I guess, infection disseminated throughout the skin, which probably wouldn't be a good thing. But uh, enough viremia so that the mosquito can then, during a blood meal, take up the virus and then allow it. That virus would then have to survive through the mosquito elements, has to go to the mid-gut and everything, and then get back out and get injected. So it really doesn't care about viruses in other places. And so everything else seems to be a byproduct and, and, and a 
fortuitous event in the context of if you consider path- pathology fortuitous, but it, uh, it's just I think inadvertent in a way because they're not really um, uh, uh, important for evolution. That's right. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Uh, why that happens and why it's retained is sort of an interesting question. There must be some evolutionary pressure to once you establish that to retain it, or um, there's not a selection against it at least. Yeah, I mean. I always think of it in terms of polio. Just think, CNS, one in 100 infections uh, has CNS involvement, but the, mm-hmm. the rest are efficiently transmitted via the feces with no GI symptoms whatsoever. Right. So except for the accidental paralysis, which drove development of vaccines, right. we wouldn't care about polio infections. That's right, and, and that's probably <laughs> true for you know West Nile. If we think about it, it's one in 100 cases yeah. that actually get you know severe disease and probably... Uh, it may be, let's say, I don't know, five or so, five in a hundred or so that might even get any virus in near the CNS, with yeah, one in a hundred yeah, actually yeah. causing major disease. So we're talking about small percentages of actual that go to these regions that lead to these clinical consequences. And yet the major other ones are the one, the, the, the rest of the cases may be still contributing to the cycle because there was yeah, viremic yeah. enough to be able to, to um, allow the, the rest of the cycle to actually carry itself out. So do you think all the Zika isolates we have from 1947 to the present. Do you think they're all able to uh, cross the fetus, cause infection of uh, progenitors, infect the testes, infect the eye all equally and we just didn't see it before? Or do you think this is something new? I think we don't know. Um, so there, uh, we, I alluded to this in my talk earlier, but there's really sort of uh, two ways to look at it. Obviously, these are RNA viruses and they can evolve very rapidly. Um, make mutations every cycle, in theory. Obviously, there's things that prevent that from going on. Is They get purified out in their uh, selection in mosquito cells, and they have to maintain their ability to infect certain mamma- mammalian cells. So there's a limit on, a cap on the evolution that can occur, and include, as well as stuff that's fatal to the virus. So one hypothesis is that the virus changed, and it during that change, it created a new virus which could cause certain clinical manifestations that were not seen before. Mm-hmm which are still infrequent. And the other hypothesis is that the virus changed and now adapted to the mosquito. So now you've got, instead of thousands of cases, you get hundreds of thousands of cases or millions of cases and rare events that were occurring all along now Mm. become visible because otherwise they're just noise. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I will say in the animal models that we've looked at, not all viruses are equal. Right Now it's, a little bit of a challenge in the mouse because the virus is not really a mouse pathogen. So if its ability to cause pathogenicity in the mouse, even if we disenable the interferon response, is not really a natural thing because the virus doesn't really do anything in the mouse. So normally, because it's restricted by the innate immune response. So it's hard to generalize based on the mouse. But if you just looked at the mouse data with that caveat, there is variability in different strains' ability to cause disease. Sure, but it sure. turns out the ones that cause more severe disease are the African strains. And of course, we didn't see all the human disease in Africa that we know of unless it was missed under the radar or there just weren't enough cases to see it. So I think we still don't know, but we have infectious clones now of many strains. So we should be able to test infectivity in certain cell types, whether that's neuroprogenitor cell types, whether we are able to infect sperm cell types or Tolly cells or whatever it may be, human ones, as well as other animals, perhaps the mouse, and begin to see how different these strains are and then how recombinant variants, once we introduce them, are. And can we isolate the sequence variation? Or is this really just a numbers game? And really, um, uh, uh, you know, if we had enough cases, we would begin to see these anyway. I think we can never really know for sure in people because we can't do the experiments right we can get a lot of data which would suggest you can't do the chick experiment in mosquitoes saying this one amino acid right. makes it replicate better that's right in mosquitoes and maybe even transmit but, but you can do it in their cells you can do it in cells absolutely right. so and, for example one virus didn't replicate at all in neuroprogenitor cells you know that would sort of be compelling to think that it might not be able yeah. to cause microcephaly. Sure. So tomorrow, a paper is going to be published in Cell. It's under embargo, but I can talk about it because this episode will not air till Sunday. They will show that, two, two independent groups show that a single amino acid change in the glycoprotein of Ebola that was selected during the outbreak in West Africa, it arose early, dominated for the rest of the outbreak, had never been seen before, increases infectivity for human cells, 
but and it decreases it for bat cells. Interesting. Suggesting that it may have been a selection to transmission. In, in humans, for human-to-human human transmission. Make, it, it's not associated with more disease, just transmission in that particular outbreak. And so that the if there's more transmission, there will be more disease by definition, but not Maybe. not more pathogenicity right. on a per virus level. Exactly, exactly. So Yeah, so this may be the same thing. Um, and that's an example where in a single outbreak, we have so many isolates that we can look at this. Correct. And we, uh, I don't think we have that for Zika, right? Not quite yet, although there are a lot of isolates that are occurring. Anyway, accruing. if you're interested in that story, uh, we're going to have Jeremy Luban on next week, who did, who is one of the authors of one of the papers, and he'll talk about it. Uh, himself. The reason I bring it up is because many papers are being published. For example, this one in MBio, uh, they compared Zika genome sequences and say, we identify amino acid substitutions that may be associated with increased epidemicity, chronic uh, uh, CZVS, what is that, congenital Zika virus syndrome, and Guillain-Barre. Well, yeah, but they may not be also, right? And I'm, I was raised in an era where you looked at a sequence and you had to do an experiment. So I would say, Vincent, that this is probably in the realm of hypothesis generating science. And yes. It yes. is important, I think, to actually do the analysis and say, what is the variation? Where is it? And uh, and that's an important analysis. And if you do enough of it, I guess, then that becomes a more significant contribution. But I also agree that really to answer the question, unless you lined up all the sequences and there was just one change and mm-hmm. there were phenotypic differences that were obvious and the experiment essentially is done – somebody's going to have to go back yeah. and do the dirty work of introducing those changes and then come up with an assay that yeah. reliably predicts, the, at least as close as possible, uh, what is what is occurring in the human condition. What bothers me is that the press picks up on this and they say Zika mutated and that's why it's doing what it is today. And that just makes, sounds me, good. makes me crazy. Yeah, it sounds great, but you can't prove it, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's the problem. And you know, I try and explain it and it's it's just... A little frustrating, but I, I know you get it, so that's not the, okay. Two more questions. So, in our uh, TWIV at ASM, you talked about why you guys focused on Zika because you saw it starting. There was already a Pacific outbreak, and you thought it might be interesting. You, you started working on it way before anybody else did. So, are there other flavies out there that have your eye and you might pick up at some point? Well, there's certainly other flavies out there. There's um. Uh, 73 or so that I'm aware of and a couple of ones that we have in the lab that there are some outbreaks occurring I have no idea whether they're going to be you know tomorrow's virus or no virus or anything but we have we've acquired them uh, because uh, we can and because I think it's interesting to do some pilot experiments so that we're aware if we need models um, that we can that we're ready to, to do those experiments fortunately for the flavivirus community the, the the repository in Galveston is really wonderful. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, they have online, uh, you can get some information and also you can write to them and find out exactly what they have. But they have almost almost every flavivirus that causes human disease and then yeah. those that are yeah. just insect only as well. And they're easily acquirable. You said something very sad today in your talk that if, you, if someone wrote a grant to study pathogenesis of Zika, you know, three years ago, they would never get funded. That's really sad. Yes and no. I mean, it's sad if, if, if it was you you or I who wrote the grant. <laughs> I think, you know, from a study section standpoint, um, certainly they have priorities on the science. If Maybe if somebody wrote that grant and wrote, had a, a, an outstanding idea to do something re- interesting. But I think the criticism would be why study Zika and why not study other yeah. relevant flaviviruses. And so there is this um, uh, sense from study section that um, not only should your science be cutting edge, but it should be relevant. And... Um, that said, if you work on a model in organism, if you study Drosophila, I think everybody says that's great because we know the power of genetics. Or if you work in C. elegans, or if you're using um, you know, a model cell that has been well characterized, you can get a lot of information. But if you're going to study pathogenesis, mm. why does a, a virus cause disease in an animal? Well, then you probably should be studying something that's relevant unless there is some tool that you have, marked virus, uh, reporter virus or whatever it is that you cannot be used in another system or yeah, cannot be yeah. done easily. I think that's probably the, the, the reason why I sort of feel that if somebody had written a grant three years ago before this outbreak, it would have been very difficult to fund a pathogenesis study, maybe an epi study, maybe a mosquito study. Because remember, there was this virus was around 2007 in Yap Island and 2013 in French Polynesia. So it's possible that if you were 
trying to predict whether this would spread and what it would take to spread. And we're going to do evolutionary and insect analysis and maybe some other cell. And maybe that could get funded. But a pathogenesis study, I think, would have been very hard. It's unfortunate because, as you know, there's a certain amount of serendipity in science. You never know where the good stuff is coming from. Correct. So my philosophy is you have a good lab. So if your lab wrote a grant you know, three years ago and said, we think this could be interesting for these reasons. Right. I would like to fund it because you have a track record, you know you know what you're doing. So I think we need to fund labs and let them go. So you mean I should put ideas. my pathogenesis grant on Beberu virus that I have uh, uh, sitting in the freezer? If it were up to me, I would say yes, but it's not. And, and as you know, money is tight. But yes. I think that you should give people a chance and you know, give them five years or four. If it doesn't work out, that's fine. But sometimes it does work out. We get restriction enzymes and PCR and CRISPR and all sorts of things Correct. that we didn't expect. And I'd hate to eliminate serendipity just because the virus doesn't seem to be important. Correct. My last question. Do you have a favorite virus? You work on so many. A favorite virus. <laughs> It's kind of a funny question, right? I don't know if I have a favorite virus. Uh, you know, my favorite virus may change from year to year. Obviously, Zika is the virus du jour in the lab right, now. Right. But, you know, historically, we've worked on West Nile for the most part of my career. And, in fact, I built my career on West Nile virus, arguably. So I think, in that sense, uh, it's a it's an old favorite, if you will. But I don't really have a favorite. Uh, we Viruses are tools. Viruses are uh, t- to learn about human biology and immunology and cell biology, but also to learn about the, them as pathogens themselves. So I don't know if I play favorites in that way. I think I, we're, I'm interested in all of them. Well, I would say if you said West Nile, it would make sense because it landed in the U.S. in Queens, not far from where you were born. Right, although I was long <laughs> gone by then. So I, I, miss, right. I miss the spraying by the helicopters. As we're sitting here in Vincent's office, these helicopters are passing up and down the <laughs> Hudson River, and I can only imagine what they were doing when they were dumping uh, p- p- pesticide over everybody in the city in 1999. Nowadays, they try not to do that. Uh, this this entomologist from the New York City Department of Health told me they don't like to spray from high up in the sky. It reminds them of Agent Orange. It scares people. They tend to do it on the ground, you know, go after the, the, the breeding pools and so forth. I want to tell you about the 2017 ASM Scientific Writing and Publishing course. Uh, this is an online course that explores writing and publishing with ASM journal editors. It's an interactive webinar series. It'll cover titles, abstracts, figures, and legends and the manuscript review process course takes place from January through April of 2017, and there is a registration deadline, December 1st. You can learn more at bit.ly slash SWPOC17. That is TWIV414. You can find this episode and all the others at iTunes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. And if you have any questions or comments, send them to TWIV at microbe.tv. Consider supporting the science show's of microbe tv go to microbe.tv slash contribute it helps us to uh, do even better content and to do remote shows at different locations with all of the crew my guest today has been michael diamond from washington university in st louis thanks so much for talking with me i appreciate it thanks vincent it was a pleasure quite a lot of fun i'm vincent racaniello you can find me at virology.ws i'd like to thank the sponsor of this show curiosity stream You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.